Thomas Aquinas, <laughs> I know you were in private practice for a long time and you tried lots of cases. Based on your observations, how has the practice of law changed over the years? Well, I, I will answer that in this fashion. Over a period of time, my practice, and I think the practice generally here in Davidson County in Nashville, changed from the straightforward rear end collision, intersection, soft tissue injury case to first more cases involving products liability. And then at some point, more and more cases involving professional liability. First, medical malpractice, and then more and more uh, legal malpractice. And the litigation became more complex when the rules changed and the state courts adopted essentially the federal rules of civil procedure. And the cases began to involve more in the way of the inspection and production of documents, the answers of interrogatories, and lengthy depositions, pretrial depositions. And in my personal experience, it followed that track and I began to try more and more cases outside of Nashville and out of state, and I, including uh, litigation in the Southern District of New York that required me to spend months and months in New York in depositions as well as extensive and lengthy depositions, months and months of, of such, and the travel related to it uh, as more and more litigation took place in the federal court here in the Middle District of Tennessee. And in that regard, a significant thing occurred in the fall of 1970 when L. Clora Morton from Knoxville was appointed United States District Court for the Middle District of Tennessee when Judge Bill Miller was moved to the Sixth Circuit. Up to that point, the, uh, the civil docket was essentially dormant here in the Middle District of Tennessee. But when Judge Morton came in the fall of 1970, it, things just broke loose. And he used to make the comment that I'm going to make it possible for you Nashville lawyers to have a race to the bank. We're going to try so many cases here and you'll make so much money out of it. And he was true to his word because we began to try a lot of cases and including here in Nashville and in, no in Cookville in the Northeastern Division and in the Columbia Division. And he was a remarkable trial judge. Uh, he had a lot of energy, enormous stamina, and was very bright. And at times, he could shoot himself in the foot. He was so quick, and he could have an explosive temperament. But he was absolutely intellectually honest, and he would work around 
and straighten things out if he had gone off the deep end. But we learned to try lawsuits, uh, and he was a good teacher. And I, I tried a lot of lawsuits in the United States District Court for the Middle District of Tennessee as well as elsewhere. And it was a great experience. Just one more question along those lines. Did, did you begin to see more women at the bar? A revolution has taken place in that <laughs> respect. When I first started to practice in 1960, when I came home from the Army, there was just a handful, well, there were no more than three or four lawyer, women lawyers in Nashville. Miss Becky Thomas was one of them. And Miss Mildred Lunn, who had been a longtime secretary to Mr. William Hume down at Hume Howard uh, Davis and Bolt. And there may have been one or two others, but Miss Mildred Lunn and Miss Becky Thomas were the two. But since then, the, uh, a revolution has taken place, not only at the bar, but on the bench. And these women lawyers have proved just how very bright they are and how industrious and worthy they are as adversaries in many instances. And so in that respect, the bar has changed dramatically over the years. Okay. Now, I want to get to your appointment uh, as United States District Court for the Middle District of Tennessee. Uh, can you give us some background? Tell us how that came about. Well, in July 1984, <clears throat> Judge Morton advised Senator Baker that he intended to take senior status and gave him some advance notice before he wrote the president that he was retiring and taking senior status under that provision of the code. And at that time, Senator Baker was the majority leader in the Senate. And he did not, he was serving his third term in the Senate, and he did not intend to run for re-election. And Judge Taylor in Knoxville also indicated that he was going to take senior status. And so Judge uh, Senator Baker was faced with vacancies, a vacancy on the Eastern District of Tennessee and Knoxville. He was going to move Ted Milburn from the district court in the Chattanooga Division of the Eastern District, which would create a vacancy on the district court in Chattanooga. And he also had the vacancy here in the Middle District of Tennessee. And at some point, uh, Senator Baker asked me to come to Knoxville to see him when the Senate was in recess and meet him at what at that time was the Baker-Stansbury Law Firm offices. And uh, I had not been active in politics to any great extent. I had participated as lawyers do in local judicial elections and the district attorney general's election, that type of thing involving local judges. And I had helped in the Winfield Dunn campaign in 1970 when my classmate John Hooker 
was the Democratic nominee running against Winfield Dunn from Memphis. And Macklin Davis, Jr., and I were co-chairmen for Davison County in support of the Dunn administration. I had earlier had helped in the Howard Baker campaign when he first ran for the Senate. Principally, I helped raise money um, in that respect, both for Howard Baker and later for Winfield Dunn. But that was pretty much the extent of my political activities. But Senator Baker was enormously busy in Washington as the majority leader in the Senate, and uh, he wanted to fill these vacancies before he left office the following January. There was to be the presidential election in November 1984. One third of the Senate would be up for election. The entire House would be standing for election. And at that point, there was a big hassle in Washington. Hassles in Washington is not anything new just because of the debt controversy we had recently. They were funding the government on a day-to-day -day basis by continuing resolutions. And yet he wanted to get these nominations moving and he invited me to come over to meet with him in Knoxville. And uh, I, I knew him, but you know, he asked the usual questions of, is there anything about your background that would embarrass the President of the United States or me? Um, that kind of thing. Um, do you have any enemies? You know, and I told him, look, Senator, I'm, I've earned a living practicing law and I've stepped on a lot of toes and I'm sure there's some hostilities. He said, oh, I'm not talking about bruised feelings among lawyers. Um, everybody knows about that. And you can cuss the court for 30 days after a lawsuit's over. I said, well, I don't, I don't know other than that that I've got any enemies. Uh, I've been in a lot of hard-fought lawsuits. And so he said, now look, I'm going to make a speech in Texas or something, and I'll call you in a few days. Don't say anything about being over here until I call you. This was on a Monday, so I'll call you Thursday. Well, I pretty well surmised that what he would do would leaked the fact that I'd been over there to talk to him to see what kind of reaction that that would stir up and whether there was anything coming out of the woodwork that he needed to know about. And interestingly, I said, uh, he said, how did you get over here? I said, well, I had a young lawyer in my office drive over here with me. I said, um, I had thought about on the way back stopping in Cookville to see Judge Morton, but in a breach of all good manners, I don't have an appointment with him. And he leaned forward and he said, how well do you know Judge Morton? I said, well, I've always kept my distance from him, but, and I've tried a lot of lawsuits in front of him, but as far as I know that uh, I get along all right with him, he's bruised my knuckles in on any in number of occasions. He said, when he told me about how he came to recommend Judge Morton's appointment, and he said, uh, well, when you get there, he's going to ask you why you've been to Knoxville. Tell him you've been over here to see an old friend of his and watch his reaction. So I start back from Knoxville with this young lawyer driving and we stop in 
in Cookville, and he's trying a, a non-jury case, and he sees me come in the courtroom, and he whispers to Judy Walford, and then he says, we'll take a recess. And Judy comes, the courtroom deputy, and said, Judge Morton wants to see you in the, in the uh, chambers. And so I go back and I said, Judge, in a breach of all good manners, I, I didn't call, make an appointment to see you, but I'm on my way back from Knoxville, and I thought I'd just stop in. And Judge Morton leaned forward and he said, what were you doing in Knoxville? I said, well, I was over there to see an old friend of yours. He said, what old friend of mine? I said, Howard Baker. And with that, Judge Morton said, you're in, you're in. I said, well, I don't know about that, Judge. He said, you're in. He said, Higgins, do you know why I never liked you? And I said, no, Judge Morton, why? Why? He said, I have suspected for years you're a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> and then he laughed and I said, he said, you're in. I said, well, I don't know about that. And I've got a lot of questions in my mind. I said, I haven't tried a criminal case in 24 years almost, or close to that. And uh, so I, I'm just not sure about it. He said, don't worry about it. You've tried all these products liability cases and commercial cases, so security cases you tried. He said, a federal criminal case, once you sweep the preliminary motions out of the way, he said, it's like falling off a log. You won't have any problem trying criminal cases. I said, well, you say so. I don't know about it. And we had a chat, and, and uh, then I came on back to Nashville. And, and then Howard Baker called me the following Thursday. He said, If the FBI, he had already gotten clearance from the White House, they were going to do what the majority leader wanted to do. Um, and he said, if the FBI is not on your doorstep next Monday, you call my man Hamby there in Nashville, who was, Bill Hamby was his assistant down here in Nashville at that time. He said, <clears throat> We're pressed for time. You're going to have to take care of the interview with the American Bar Association yourself. He said, once the invest background investigation is completed, he said, uh, I can move it out of the Justice Department to the White House. And if the president's in the city, I can move it out of the White House in one day. And he said, then when it comes to the Senate, we have our own way of doing things. And so, fortuitously, the American College of Trial Lawyers was meeting in Chicago shortly after that, and I had intended to go to that, and when the ABA representative for the Sixth Circuit called me about an interview, I arranged, and he was a fellow of the college, I arranged to meet him in Chicago on the Sunday after the black tie dinner the night before. And so I got that out of the way. And the FBI came promptly up to Cornelius, Collins, and Higgins on that Monday. <clears throat> and they began to take palm prints and fingerprints, and that agent said, have you ever been fingerprinted before, Mr. Higgins? I said, yes, sir. Well, he said, when was that? I said, well, when I applied for a commission. He said, uh, we didn't come to you on that occasion, did we? I said, no, sir. <laughs> and so, so the background investigation progressed, and the uh, 
and there's a lot of paperwork to be submitted to first the Justice Department and then the United States Senate, detailed financial information and background information and so forth. And that's how it came about. Well, and then that was late July and August. And on the day after Labor Day in September, I was taking depositions when the receptionist came and said, Mr. Higgins, the White House is on the telephone. <laughs> The president's calling, so I said, well, excuse me, gentlemen, and I left the deposition room, and White House telephone operator said, please hold for the president. And this very soft voice came on the phone, Mr. Higgins, yes, sir. He said, I have some papers here in front of me. I'm getting ready to sign on the recommendation of Senator Baker to send your name to the United States Senate as the nominee for the vacancy on the United States District Court. And before I sign the papers, I just want to be sure whether you will accept. And I said, I accept, Mr. President. He said, well, I'm delighted. And I said, well, I'm grateful to you and to Senator Baker he said, well, we're very proud of Senator Baker. He's, he's a great friend and supporter. And uh, then President Reagan said, uh, well, how is Mrs. Higgins and how are the children and how is your mother? My mother was almost 90 at the time. And I said, fine, fine. Thank you for inquiring. And he said, uh, I wound up by asking him to convey my regards to Mrs. Reagan, and he said he would, and he said, thank you very much for your willingness to serve, and he said, I'll sign the papers and send them to the Senate. And so that was the day after Labor Day, and shortly after that, Senator Strom Thurmond's office called. He was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and his counsel said, we're scheduling a hearing on your nomination on such and such date about the middle of September. I said, that's fine with me. He said, well, you need to come up here a little ahead of time. We want to chat with you. I said, I'll be there. And so the hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee took place about the middle of September. And I had a delegation of lawyers, my classmates from law school, um, your partner, Al Abbey, one of my classmates at your law firm, among others, went to uh, support my nomination for, for the Senate Judiciary Committee. And um, that took place, and then the nomination moved out of the committee to the floor of the Senate, and it was on the executive calendar for October the 3rd. This was just about 30 days from the time my nomination went to the Senate, and I was expecting to hear from Senator Baker, and 10 o'clock news came that night, no word, and I told Jetty, I said, you know, I'm not going to fool with this any longer. The law firm doesn't know what's going to happen. The clients don't know what's going to happen. And um, if this thing gets pushed over till after the election to the new Congress in um, January, I just can't keep this all in suspense. So the next morning I come to the office and when I get there, the receptionist said, Senator Baker was trying to reach you and he said he would call at home. And Jetty took the call and he said, we've been in session all night. 
and about 5.30 or 6 o'clock, I took up these nominations, and uh, how does it feel to be the wife of a new United States District Judge? And Jenny, I think, said something about, well, I'm greatly relieved, Senator. He said, well, I'm going home, take a shower, and try to get a little sleep. I, the Senate's going to reconvene it at 1 o'clock, and this was about 8 o'clock Nashville time, 7 o'clock Washington time. He said, tell Tom I'll talk to him later in the day. So with that, um, I found out that it's more difficult to get out of the practice of law than it is to begin the practice of law. That was the 4th of October, and I wasn't sworn in until the 4th of December. Uh, it took me that long to get all my name off the pleadings um, and to uh, consult with all the clients about whether they wanted the business to stay at Canadians and Collins or go somewhere else. And of course, Judge Wiseman was waiting for me to take the oath so he, I could go to work. And then I was sworn in on December the 4th. And there are only two happy days, the days that you're sworn in and the, uh, and the day your portrait is hung. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how it came about. Well, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, going from a trial lawyer in, with Cornelius and Collins uh, the federal judge, that involves some financial sacrifice. Just why did you want to be a judge in the first place? I guess I had harbored in a somewhat suppressed fashion the wonder whether I could could do the job. And uh, when the opportunity came, it was just too good to be true. Um, but I said yes and never looked back. Now, this must be a bone-crushing que question that's coming up. Let's you take a break a minute. I want you to get that. relaxed before I ask this next one. Pardon? We need to take a break. Recess. 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 All right. All right, Judge, you confirmed and sworn in, assumed the bench. Now, of course, you've been a trial lawyer all your professional life. What was it like to become a judge? It was a, a remarkable change. Tom Wiseman, as the chief judge, sent me a civil jury case to try the following week. I was sworn in on one Monday and tried my first jury case the following Monday. And then I was off and running from that point. I took my secretary with me from the law firm and uh, set about to get two law clerks that I was authorized to employ a secretary and two law clerks. And I had Judge Morton's chambers that he had occupied in Nashville. He moved to Cookville and established his chambers up there. He lived in Cookville. And then the work, the, the docket was divided 
the other judges uh, sent me uh, a certain number of civil and criminal cases on their docket, so I had a ready docket almost immediately. And the, the actual trial work was not all that novel because I had tried a lot of lawsuits, including a lot of federal work. One of the things that stands out in my mind as I look back, and I thought I was a reasonably sophisticated lawyer, was the amount of work that a district judge handles that lawyers never see who are in the courtroom, there is almost an unending flow of pro se business, uh, both people who walk in off the street and get the forms at the clerk's office and file a, a, a complaint alleging first one thing or another, as well as the prisoner pro se litigation. And all of that has to be dealt with uh, try to decipher what it is that's being alleged, make some sense out of it, dictate a, uh, or write a brief memorandum and enter the appropriate order. And so there is a lot of work that just takes place in chambers uh, unrelated to the courtroom business. And of course, the criminal work was something that was essentially new to me. Uh, I mentioned the fact that I had earlier talked to Judge Morton about that. And that was something that I had to get my arms around. And uh, learn to deal with. And early on, the uh, certain indictments were returned in the Eastern District of Tennessee in what was known as the butcher cases arising out of the collapse of those banking chains up there that those two brothers were the head of. And all the judges in the Eastern District of Tennessee recused themselves and the Sixth Circuit uh, designated me to sit in the Eastern District of Tennessee to try those indictments. And so I got an early dose of criminal work in a hurry. And those were cases where there had been massive publicity, pretrial publicity. And I ultimately moved the cases from the Knoxville Division to the Chattanooga Division and uh, tried the lead case, uh, lasted about four weeks down in Chattanooga after a lot of pretrial motions had to be dealt with with the help of a magistrate judge who would file a report and recommendation. And uh, so I got a, emerged, immersed in federal criminal practice early on. And then it just progressed from that. And about July 1985, I hadn't been on a bench a year. Judge Morton transferred to me, to my docket, the statewide prison conditions litigation after there had been riots in all the state prisons across the state. And um, this was a massive uh, class action brought on behalf of state prisoners about the conditions in the Tennessee prison system. And that uh, uh, required a lot of attention. Uh, for about the next eight years until the case was closed. 
in 1992. Um, it also involved closing the uh, Tennessee State Penitentiary here in Nashville with those enormous stone walls. And I earlier had mentioned something about a Carthaginian peace. And I recall one amusing thing that occurred in the midst of all of that travail. The attorney for the class action plaintiffs asked me to close the prison and I asked him, what, do you want me to uh, require the state to tear those enormous stone walls down? And harking back to what I said about high school Latin and studying the Punic, Punic Wars, I, I said, do you want me to impose a Carthaginian peace on the <laughs> state of Tennessee? <laughs> And had he had the benefit of high school Latin and had read the Punic Wars, he should have responded. I gave him the perfect opening. He should have responded, yes, Judge, I want those walls dismantled stone by stone and the ground plowed and sown with salt. And I told him later, I said, you spend too much time reading those American Civil Liberty Union journals. You ought to study a little bit about the Punic Wars. I gave you the perfect opening. The Attorney General of Tennessee, Mr. Burson, who went on to become Vice President Gore's counsel, said, Judge, what, is, what was the Punic Wars? Punic Wars. I said, Burson, have you ever heard of Hannibal? <laughs> and so, so much for their uh, classical or lack of a classical education. Well, I just wanted to close that circle because I'd mentioned Oh, I judge it. Let me, let me ask you this. Of course, when you went on the bench, you were hearing cases uh, where the lawyers uh, who were appearing before you had been your adversaries or sometimes uh, your partners in, uh, in some case. Uh, what do you think those lawyers uh, what, what was their perception of you? I have no idea what their perception <laughs> was. Probably bad. But I never heard a single case involving Cornelius and Collins. I wrote the clerk a letter about the matters that I would recuse myself in. And I recused myself in all Cornelius and Collins cases, and you, judges also list their financial holdings to avoid being assigned any cases where there might be a financial interest. Now, you know, um, I don't, I didn't have any problem that I'm conscious of as far as lawyers with whom I was, had had an intimate relationship during the practice, my practice of law, trying cases in front of me. Uh, um, they, I, can, I can say that I never had an experience where lawyers took an inappropriate liberty because they knew me. Um, and. Uh, and I think I was able to deal with it on the merits and not uh, do what I think is some judges have been troubled with in the past of bending over backwards to attempt to demonstrate my own integrity by being unduly hard on a lawyer or his, his position or client's position because I had had a long-standing relationship with the lawyer. It's, it's a delicate matter, but it's one that you just have to deal with, particularly at a, a, a 
a smaller community. Now, it's probably not that much of a problem in the Southern District of New York where one lawyer would only be in front of a judge in the Southern District of New York at Foley Square once or twice in his career. Um, the bar is so large and there's so much litigation. But as far as I'm aware of consciously, I was never had a problem in that respect. The one thing that I, I found was being a district judge is a pretty remote sort of business. You mean isolated from other lawyers? Isolated. Lawyers. You know, it's a long way from 8th and Broad to the Cumberland Club at uh, 4th and Union or Satsuma's, another restaurant in Nashville where lawyers, my partners and I and other lawyers would see one another regularly at lunch. And so that was something I had to deal with at the beginning. Um, and over time, it just was sort of just, I, I just learned to accept it and uh, it didn't present any real problems. It is important to be conscious that you've got to be circumspect with regard to social social matters and uh, um, and not uh, engage in something that could be deemed to be uh, inappropriate um, arising out of a social uh, occasion of um, where there might be um, a suggestion of uh, uh, of an unduly close relationship. Well, Tom, if I can mention this one thing, and I don't recall ever trying but one case before you, and we'd been friends for years. We'd tried cases with each other, against each other, and uh, Anybody that thought I was getting any favors in there was wrong. You know, you made me jump through every hoop there was, and you had fun doing it. Isn't that right? I think I probably, when I put that question of jurisdiction to you <laughs> over the citizenship of uh, Yale University, <clears throat> I may have it turned to sideways so I wouldn't <laughs> show anything in the way of a smile or something. I, I knew that I was... Uh, to use a word that I was uh, bugging you, but it was, you know, there's no way to agree to jurisdiction in a federal court. It's a court of limited jurisdiction. You can't stipulate it. You can't agree to it. You can't overlook it. The court has an has a independent responsibility to determine that it has jurisdiction. The first question in a federal case when the case crosses the threshold is why is it here and what is the jurisdictional basis? So well, one, one other question about the case, particular case, you know which one I'm talking about, uh, that you made me jump through all the hoops. When we finally, well, it really, I said we, Andre Blumstein found it, found the uh, Charter of Incorporation for Fisk University. It was about five pages long and in a, in handwritten, not typed. Do you recall that? Vaguely. And we handed it to you, and you looked at it. For, did you actually read it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I pursued it. Uh, uh, I don't have that much of a recollection of it, but um, I satisfied myself that it was a certified copy from the... <laughs> County Register's office, where the at that time charters of incorporation had to be filed in the local register's office, in addition to being on file in the Secretary of State's office. But um, yeah, I, 
I examine documents pretty closely. All right. <laughs> Judge, the honor of Tom, however you <laughs> wish me to address you, we're about to run out of time here. And you've had a great deal of experience both as a litigator in the courtroom and on the bench as a judge. And it might be helpful for the members of the bar if you have any advice for them about how the law ought to be practiced. Well, I'll give you some just general observations. The number one prerequisite for a lawyer is absolute integrity in dealing with the court and adversary counsel. And a lawyer should be very conscious of the importance of his own integrity. And I'll give you a simple illustration. It's one thing for a lawyer to stand up and say, Judge, I need a continuance in this case because my client is sick and not able to come to court. As opposed to the lawyer standing up and saying, Judge, I need a continuance in this case because my client's wife called me this morning and said that he had been throwing up all night and is sick and can't come to court. In the first illustration, the lawyer is making a representation of fact that he knows of his own knowledge that the client is sick. In the second illustration, the lawyer is very careful and in a lawyer-like fashion is saying, Judge, I'm telling you only what my client's wife has said and I'm not vouching for the truth of the matter myself. A court has a right to expect that a lawyer will be precise with regard to his representations to the court. <clears throat> and in my view, the function of a lawyer is to prevail on behalf of his client by every honorable means. And that requires the lawyer to stop short of stepping over the line just in order to prevail. And so a, a lawyer has to be on guard about there are limits beyond which it's not permissible to step. Now, with that said with regard to the prerequisite that every lawyer has to be conscious of the importance of dealing with absolute candor and integrity with regard to his relationship with the court as an officer of the court and also with regard to adversary counsel. My other observations without extending this too much relates to what I have noticed as a major change since I left the practice of law and it, frankly, I was astonished at the rapidity which it has taken place. And that is this business of having other lawyers settle their lawsuits. And I know you've been engaged in this business of mediation. 
And I have conducted uh, settlement conferences uh, as a judge, and I think there is a role that judges can play with regard to settlement conferences. They need to be very careful that they not get in the business of blackjacking parties into a settlement. And for that reason, here in this district, uh, we have generally avoided conducting settlement conferences in which we would be the trier of fact sitting without a jury. And that brings me to the point that I think there is an increasing tendency, and it's already well developed, where lawyers do not know how to talk to one another or they are unwilling to do it for fear that it be taken as a sign of weakness and they want another lawyer, an independent an intermediary such as yourself to do the heavy lifting. They don't want to take the responsibility of telling the client your lawsuit is not worth anywhere near what I thought it was when you first walked through the door in my office. Or on the other hand, they don't, if they're for the defense, they don't want to take the responsibility of going back to the general counsel or the home office and saying, listen, we're facing with a disaster down here and we're on the verge of getting socked. You're just going to have to give me more authority. They want someone else to bear that burden. And I think that it's an important role, important role of the lawyer to handle the negotiations in cases in which the lawyer is involved and, and deal with his adversary in an absolutely honorable fashion. And that is a change that that uh, I'm not at all uh, pleased with as far as the practice of law. I think the role of the lawyer has a real role to play with regard to negotiations. And, uh, and the, they need to learn to deal and talk with one another. And part of that stems from the fact that the bar has gotten a lot larger. They don't uh, hunt and fish or float the river with one another. They don't have a drink of whiskey at the end of the day. I frankly think lawyers spend too much time going to the gymnasium, taking exercise, working up a sweat, and then a, taking a bath in a public bathhouse. They'd be better off having a drink with other lawyers at the end of the day and learning to talk with one another. But that's just an old-fashioned, worn-out intersection lawyer's observation for whatever it's worth. And another factor that, that, that I'm not at, at all pleased about, just, and I recognize the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States, and that is the widespread advertising uh, by lawyers, which I think is unprofessional. And it makes the, what was once a learned profession more and more uh, the hustle and bustle for business. And that's not a criticism of, the, of just the sole practitioner who advertises in the telephone book about his expertise in the defense of driving under the influence cases. That also applies to the big law firms that engage in 
what I think is borderline impropriety as far as advertising. So I, I want to be even-handed about it. But I think it detracts from professionalism and the, uh, the practice of law has become more and more business oriented, particularly in the field of what I think of the exploitation of young lawyers and the amount of billable hours that they are required. Um, and this business of, quote, staffing, close quoting lawsuits, and I, I've seen that as a judge when there have been application for fees. This business of having three and even four lawyers attend a deposition, or three lawyers at tables, at the council table on a, a rel relatively straightforward motion wouldn't require three lawyers to argue a motion for summary judgment. <laughs> and that, that is just something since you've given me the opportunity to ventilate that I want to get out of my system. All right. Tom, we're about to wind this up in a minute. Just uh, one more question. Uh, what are you doing now? I'm essentially sitting under my own fig tree um, and uh, and I enjoy the opportunity to have this time and feel greatly blessed in this respect with Jetty um, and also to see uh, more of the children and the ch grandchildren that we've been blessed with. And I have a farm that I, I can go down and walk around, not do any work. And I can go down to the river where I've got some property on the buffalo and the duck. And uh, in the wintertime, put a log on the fire and smoke a cigar and, and spit pretty much wherever I please. Uh, I'm careful not to smoke in Mrs. Higgins' house. I'll smoke up here in the bankruptcy courtroom. But when I first went on the bench, Jetty said, now you can do pretty much whatever you want to do at 8th and Broad, but be careful that you don't get in contempt of my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I have followed her injunction uh, to the letter in that respect. I, I never suggest that she's cooked the wrong egg. Uh, or burnt the toast, not that she would, but I still keep a hand in. Uh, I try a criminal case every now and then. I really don't want to get stuck in something that's going to last three weeks. I don't want to be bogged down in a Title VII case that goes on and on forever. Uh, and I, I enjoy conducting the naturalization proceedings and the, uh, the other judges, they're very charitable. They, uh, they uh, tolerate me. And I enjoy the ceremonial sittings of the court whenever the rare occasions, as we did just recently, swear in a new district judge and or swear in the United States Marshal or the United States Attorney. And I enjoy those occasions and the naturalization ceremonies. But for the most part, uh, with the exception of the few cases I try from time to time, um, just mark me down as a uh, worn out 
broken down old judge. Uh, well, Tom, I want to thank you for being here today, and if I may, thank you on behalf of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. It's been well, I don't know why you want to go home uh, so early. I've got a lot more to say, uh, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll just save that for another day. But it's past cocktail time. <laughs> we can all have a drink of whiskey. Good night. <laughs> thank you very much, Tom. I, I've enjoyed it, and I hope in some small way it's served some use. Thank you.